When we first think about motherhood, or when we find out we're pregnant, there are so many questions to ask ourselves and to ask others. There are questions for our doctor, questions about the nursery, questions about birth, questions about postpartum. But there may be one question that you forgot to ask someone who's very important in the equation, your partner. And that question is, how are you feeling? Oftentimes we get so swept up in the massive to-do list and how we are physically feeling that we forget to ask our partners what they might be going through. And not only that, but our partners are probably taking a back seat to talk about it because they're in the support zone. They've gone into protector mode and they don't dare talk about their feelings. Mental health and licensed clinical social work therapist Ellie Weinstein is on the show today to give us the partner's perspective. Not only is he a therapist, but he's a dad who personally experienced a severe panic attack two months postpartum. He gives us the tools to support our partner and to make sure that their experience is recognized during our journey, so hopefully they can remain healthy both physically and mentally. Ellie has a podcast called The Dude Therapist that I had the privilege to be a guest on, where he shares openly about his own experiences that have encouraged him to support others through anxiety disorders, parenting issues, relationship issues, and more. You are listening to the Mamas in Training podcast, giving aspiring and expecting moms guidance and community from moms who have been there. And I'm your host, Jessica Lorian. Since my motherhood journey has been delayed due to an autoimmune disease, I've decided to take this time of waiting and learn all about motherhood before I actually am one. I'm just like you, and we're in this together. By the end of the show today, you'll know the way to reach out to your partner and start a conversation about how they're feeling, as well as a great tip for avoiding maternal gatekeeping or having your partner feeling like the third wheel during postpartum. So let's get to it. On to the show. Since I was a kid, I've always wanted to be a dad. As we've discussed a little bit off camera and stuff like that, my wife and I went through infertility. So to me, just having the opportunity to be a parent, to, to be able to be a father is a lifelong dream. To be able to spread love, show love, be affectionate, and to to just have a good time with another human being that is so part and parcel of who I am. And fatherhood is a journey of being able to really pass on values and and love and hopefully with my ancestry and everything that has been done to me, I can either change, adjust, and help create another person that passes on more love into the world. It teaches you like values and perspective and patience and this thing that I don't think any other experience can. Your journey and your struggle with infertility and you went through IVF and even during birth, your baby's heartbeat stopped for a moment. There were a lot of emotions that went on there. How would you say you navigated supporting your wife and also managing your own emotions during that time? Great question. The answer is I didn't. I did not do it very well. Um, I very much hyper focused on supporting my wife. I think as a therapist, you know, with the you know uh, postpartum depression and and you know prepartum issues and her emotions. One of the things that I tried to do a lot was during the infertility issues and all the shots and procedures was to try to be as strong as I possibly can because she was the one who took the brunt of of the poking and prodding. So I really focused on helping her and and helping her be Wonder Woman, support her and to to hold her up and and hold her when she needed to cry and and laugh with her. And what actually happened through that process of hyper-focusing on her, I totally forgot about myself. And when my daughter was born and she was okay, my wife was okay, I I actually had an opportunity to leave the room and tell my family, you know, everything's okay, we're good. Everyone broke down crying because it was a very scary experience. We thought we were going to lose both of them. Uh, And I ran to the bathroom and literally vomited. Mm -hmm. My body just couldn't contain Mm -hmm. itself. And I went on a very extreme 
uh, aggressive perspective of being my wife's rock for about two months, three months of my daughter's life. And then I had a massive panic attack about three months into my daughter's life mm-hmm. that gain, helped me gain perspective. You know, there's a, a great psychologist, Dr. David Burns, who talks about this metaphor of, of hiding our emotions. Like, I don't know if you had the experience as a teenager when your parents ask you to clean the room and you really just take everything and hide it in the closet or underneath the bed so they don't <laughs> yeah. see it or you shove everything into one drawer so they don't yeah. know that the dirt and oh, your room is clean. Well, I was doing that. I was basically hiding all my emotions, not processing, not dealing with them, and hiding them away. And something clicked that opened that closet and let them all out. And that was my panic attack. And Mm -hmm. it helped me kind of look at my my stuff, look at my garbage, look at all the unprocessed emotions and gain perspective that I also need to take care of myself. And it was a a big learning experience that I, I think as a therapist and as a father and as a human being, as a husband, really helped me a lot more than... I ever expected from getting a panic attack. Now, in thinking back to that moment, or even during the, I mean, this was probably a whole year, right? Between the infertility, the IVF treatments, getting pregnant, the entire journey, and then the two months postpartum. During that entire journey, what can you think back were some emotions that you were going through that maybe if you had dealt with them, you wouldn't have gone to that point of having the panic attack? Um, fear. I was afraid. I was afraid that if, you know, we had two rounds of IVF, one failed, um, and we had one that worked, my daughter, um, and the fear of not having the family that we hoped to have. Um, would we be failures? Would we not ever be parents? Um, would that affect our relationship? Will this affect our relationship, the infertility journey? Um, how will having a kid change us? Um, I have a chronic illness. So having a kid was like scary, a little scary for me of how will I be able to show up as a father? Can I be a good husband and a father? Can I do both? Can I do it all? All these emotions and fear really, it was, it was a fear based Mm -hmm. thought process. Um, of course I had excitement and joy. I didn't need to process that. I didn't need to work through that. That was great. Yeah. I'm so damn excited to be a father, to have a kid, to hold my baby. And, and I am the king of naps with my child. <laughs> like my wife is actually pregnant with baby number two. Oh, um, congratulations. Uh, also failed first IVF. Tra- we had to do IVF mm-hmm. again. One round failed. Second round it was, it was successful. Hopefully everything goes well. Um, I'm so excited for the baby naps. Like that was my zone. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, uh, like all that joy and love that I wasn't worried about that. It was so much fear and worry of maybe sadness and, and trying to please. And I'm a people pleaser. So make sure my wife, like a peacekeeper, make sure she's okay. Make sure she's, and trying to, to really focus on her was really, I was avoiding dealing with my fears and my worries. Now, are you dealing with your fears now with the second pregnancy better or different than you did in the first? I don't really have them as much. Because mm-hmm. now as, as a parent, I know what somewhat to expect. Of course, this child could be drastically different and throw us for a loop. But I know what to expect about the process. I know what to expect about not sleeping, how my wife is feeling and how I'm feeling. I know how to communicate better with what I'm feeling and if I need a break and if I need help. I have resources to go back to my therapist if I need help more. Um, on anxiety medication to help with my fears and anxieties. I'm a lot more prepared and like, sh- you know, strapped with, with uh, more tools on yeah. my belt a little bit to be able to deal with that in a more productive, healthier way when I didn't know what to expect before with the fears and anxieties that came along with the, the whole process. Now, for the female side, the birthing person side, oftentimes it's just about us. We're just focusing on us. And maybe yeah. our, our support partner comes with us to some classes. Hopefully they want to be involved. Sometimes they don't want to be. Sometimes they physically can't be, depending on where they're at. But how, especially in this preparation time, how can we, as the, the female or the birthing person, how can we support our partners in knowing that something 
as real as a fear or any other type of emotion could be something that they're working through, how can we support them in that? I mean, because sorry, sometimes we're just like, okay, yeah, but like, we're the ones that are pregnant. We're the ones going through all this, you know, like, I don't have time for that. But, but if we do have the mental space, or we're a mama in training, so maybe this is just something we're aware of, luckily beforehand, how can we support our partners in that? Ask, Mm. ask the question. You're a thousand percent right. The birthing parent is the one who's pregnant, Mm. is the one who's dealing with the physical changes, the emotional ups and downs, the hormone adjustments, readjustments, overwhelming things that are happening internally that you have no control over. You have every right to feel that way. But you have someone next to you, if you're lucky to have someone next to you with that process. Hmm. If the person's there, it never hurts to go, hey, bro, dude. I don't know how do you refer to your significant other. Uh, my wife does not call me bro or dude. Um, I would laugh if she did. That would be hilarious. But if she, if, if my wife ever turned to me and said, you know, here's what I'm worrying about. What are you thinking? Right? Because I'm sure that maybe at least five out of ten of those fears or worries or concerns, they're also thinking about. But if you open up and say, oh, I'm here. Well, here's what I'm worried about. You know, I just wanted to let you know, I'd love to talk to you about it. Pick your brain. What are you thinking about that? All of a sudden, it might open the door to feeling some semblance of validation that they don't feel alone in that zone in their head that they're in. And sometimes it's really just about asking, you know, I know we're going to go through this process. What are some of the things you're worried about? You want to talk about it. If they say yes, be there. No judgment. No attacking. No trying to fix or change the perspective, but listen. And if they don't want to talk to you for whatever reason, don't take offense by it, but let them come to you when they're ready. But you creating the space for them to feel that comfort, unfortunately falls on you and it falls on them to reach into that space to talk. Mm -hmm. And it's not always so easy, But just like you feel comfortable as the birthing parent to say to your significant other, hey, I'm really struggling right now. Um, You have no idea what doors that might open for them to feel the same way. I love, too, the key that you said, try not to fix it. Because I know even myself, many women, we do. We we try to fix. We try to comfort. We try to manage. And sometimes it's not a matter of doing any of that. But just like you said, just being there and listening and opening that door. Which is funny, by the way, because if you look at the classic old school research of any work on relationships, we'll take the most famous one, Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus, Dr. Gray's book on the difference between men and women. The biggest distinction is that men are usually considered the fixers, but it's not (laughs) about the gender. It's about the energy that someone brings. Totally. So you can have more of a masculine energy as a woman and more feminine energy as a man. Mm -hmm. My wife is more of the fixer. She's the one who has the, let's do this, this, and that. She's a type A personality, so it's like, let's make a plan, let's do it. What's the mm-hmm. what's the logic? Let's go for it. And I'm like the feeler, more like, one second, like, let's process this. Let's think about it. Let's, let's, let's be in the emotions. Mm-hmm. And I'm a man. I'm a pretty, you know, big guy, more, you know, masculine looking. Mm-hmm. My wife is feminine looking, but it doesn't mean that we can't flip-flop our energies Completely. on certain topics. So it's not about... Who brings that in as a relationship when someone brings, especially during the ups and downs of pregnancy, pre-pregnancy, infertility, all that stuff that's wrought with emotions and pain and suffering and energy, excitement and happiness. Just be with the emotions. Don't try to fix anything. Because sometimes there isn't a good fix or an answer. And sometimes the person even isn't looking for a fix or an answer. They just want their person to just be with them in that emotion. So just, I love that you're the fixer. I love that. Yeah, yeah, definitely am. (laughs) Completely. So now with your second birth coming up, you had mentioned that now you're not really experiencing those fears. You kind of know what to yet. expect. There might be, well, yet, right, right. There might be things that come. <laughs> exactly. But if you could put yourself into the shoes of you years ago when, when you were there, knowing now what you went through, are there things that you could have or would have done differently to prepare yourself to not experience that panic attack? I mean, I know you mentioned communication and like we can ask, but is there anything else that you would have done? 
I would have spoken up more. Um, I think I was trying to tiptoe so much. Not that my wife has ever made me feel like I need to walk on eggshells. Mm -hmm. But I felt I had to be the rock and strong one, which I do often in my life in certain relationships. I've fallen into that or pushed myself into that thought process of being the, the strong one or the rock that I need to be calm and collected for everyone else to, to be their feelings and do their feelings. Maybe that's just the therapist in me. I don't know. Mm. And the fears that I actually have now are more about how my daughter is going to be with the newborn. How are we going to balance mm. loving her as well as loving another child and comparing the two and how am I going to love another child? I already have yeah. this love for this child. Like those are more of my worries, but I'm not, consumed as much about it as I was going from zero to one because I never was a parent and I read all the books I mean I don't think there's enough books written for fathers hmm. I think a lot of the fatherhood books I have to say and I don't mean to bash any books I can't name them anyways because I barely read them because to me it was a waste of time a lot of the fatherhood books that I read were like just show up as a parent just be there and you'll fix everything. It was never about the emotions and struggle of fatherhood, but the basic foundation of what it means to be a supportive father and supportive partner. And that wasn't where my head was at. So my goal in life is actually to write a fatherhood, a father book, a, a, a book for men and like okay. that perspective. We'll wait for uh, it. You I heard it wait. here. I suck at writing. Yep. <laughs> that is a massive fear of mine. So nope. let's see when that happens. No, nope. <laughs> you can do it. <laughs> uh, you, I, this, this is, I need you to be my cheerleader. You'll text yep. me every couple of days like, so are you writing? <laughs> Check in, you in Nelly. <laughs> Check in. So are you writing your book yet? Ah. Yep. But in reality, what I would go back and tell myself would be that you have the person that you married or you're in a long-term relationship with that you love and trust. You need to trust each other and work on it together because there are going to be nights that are so rough that you can't prepare for, no matter how much you talk about it. Nights that your child is up every 30 minutes or an hour, not sleeping for whatever reason, and you are just tortured and at your end. But we got through it. We're here. And most parents get through it and have more kids if they can, <laughs> right? Yeah. They wouldn't if they didn't, if it was that torturous, they wouldn't. Yeah. There's something about it that keeps people coming back mm -hmm. somehow for some reason. <laughs> and so it really is that perspective that your parents got through it. Your in-laws got through it. Your brother got through it. People you know have got through it. It doesn't mean that it's not hard, but the person next to you has your back and you have theirs. Mm -hmm. Trust them. They trust you. Be open and communicate because... Once you start opening up communicating and saying how hard it is, and they're like, I know, isn't it so hard? You're like, oh, okay, I'm not alone. Mm -hmm. Because you could talk to your blue in the face with other people, but they're not there in the room with you when your child's screaming like bloody murder when there's nothing wrong. Now, I know that you're probably a little biased to this because you are a therapist, but I know that oftentimes the conversation of therapy can come up even during pregnancy or, or preconception but what if it even comes up during postpartum or, or these other moments? And I know there tends to be a stigma, especially with males, yeah. feeling like, you know, therapy is a is a bad word or bad thing or whatever, or you need help, so therefore you're not strong enough, any of that crap. What do you say to specifically the males who might be listening or how we as females can we support our partners in letting them know that this is a viable option? Love that question. Yes, I am very much biased, but I did go through the experience of doubting me going to therapy. Um, when I was on the floor, pacing, in a ball, pulling my hair out with a panic attack and anxiety, not being able to breathe, feel comfortable, I couldn't even sit and watch Friends, which is my favorite show. I couldn't be comfortable. I couldn't just calm and laugh. I couldn't enjoy life. When you're struggling that much, it's not that you don't want to get help. It's you don't know how or can't. And sometimes it takes another person to step up and be strong and say, you need help. It's not about what you're saying. It's how you're saying it and the tone that you're saying it. If you come to your person and you're like, okay, you're crazy. You're insane. You need to get help. No one's going to want to hear that. That sounds attacking. But if you come with compassion and grace and love... And you say, I see that you're struggling. 
You don't seem like yourself. Something seems off. I love and I care about you. I would love to be able to help you. I don't always know how. I think you need to talk to someone who might be able to help you that's not me. I'm here. I love you. I care about you. I want you to get help. And I'm here to talk it out with you, whatever you're worried about. And it's one of the reasons, actually, that I started posting more and more about fatherhood is after I had that anxiety attack, I knew I had to start talking about it. Not for me, but for other people who might go through it. And I have to tell you, the amount of responses I got from other men talking about their fears of fatherhood was so interesting, but none of them went for help. None of them. And I'm talking about maybe 15, 20 people that responded right away. And it's interesting now that I've opened a private practice, I have more men in my practice than I do women that I've never experienced before as a therapist working. Mostly it was women more than men. And I don't brand myself as only working with men. I work with everyone. I love working with anybody and everyone. But the more we make it a conversation, the more people like, for example, Dak Shepard, Justin Baldoni, athletes like uh, DeMar DeRozan, Kevin Love, um, uh, Naomi Osaka, and Simone Biles. They're women. But men and these quote-unquote strong men, uh, big massive quotes, are vulnerable and real. It makes a difference for men to see that it's okay to talk. And I'll just say off the bat, for anyone who's listening or might be listening, a partner of a man or a man who might be tuning in and listening, Therapy is not there to brainwash you or to convince you or to make you feel less. It's not judgment. It's another human being with you in your experience of being human who has an objective perspective that might be able to give you a different perspective on life. That's really the secret Mm -hmm. of therapy. I'm sorry for all those people who might be going to school for years. (laughs) That's really, I I, I help, I I, I educate interns right now. I have an intern that works, that that I'm helping learn while they're in school. And it's really the biggest thing. It's learning how to be human with another human. That's Mm -hmm. really the key of being a therapist. It's no frills. I'm not here to like deep dive into your psyche of who you wanted to sleep with as a child (laughs) and Freudian and what your dreams are. If that works for some people, go ahead. Go have fun with that. But modern therapy is just another human being being with you. And through your experience of pain, suffering, joy, happiness, success, who wouldn't want that person in their life who's there to support? And it doesn't have to be every week. You can make it once a month. Hmm. It doesn't have to be once a month. It could be twice a month. Whatever works for you. But you shouldn't have to carry the burdens of life by yourself. And you shouldn't put that on the people in your life that you love. Sometimes it takes a third party to get the help that you need. So it really is how, to answer your question again, it's really how you come to that person and show them the love that you care about them, not that you think that something's terribly wrong and that they have a problem right. to fix. And I think it's important, too, to recognize that even if you have a solid relationship, I mean, you can have the best partnership in the world and really know how to communicate and really know how to work through challenges and issues, but you still are going to be going through uncharted territory and might need the ears of someone who's just completely non-biased and completely out of the the situation, right? Yeah, who's not involved. Right. When you're involved in a situation, you you don't not that you're doing it on purpose, you have natural biases to yeah, it's personal. whatever experience. What if your partner has a problem with you? Mm-hmm. I don't know about you, but it would take a very strong person to not take it personally. Right. When it has nothing to do with personally, but someone's venting or talking to you, but a third party, I'm a relationship specialist and I work with couples and individuals and relationships. And a lot of the stuff I do is just being a third party who's objective, Mm -hmm. who won't take offense to a venting session or being frustrated about something happening between the two people. It has nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. Um, And also there's something called compassion fatigue, which is the ability to handle compassion. We all have depending on the day, a marker of how much we have in our tank to give to another person. As a therapist, I have no stake in the matter. I have all compassion because I don't know you. Mm -hmm. I might know you every week, but I don't know you. I'm not dealing with the other stressors that are happening within your life, financial, household, work. I'm just dealing with you for an hour, not 24 hours a day like your significant other. 
Mm. There's a limit to how much another person in your life can handle, no matter how close you are. And when that runs out, they can't be helpful. I think that's an, an interesting point, too, because something that I wanted to bring up next, actually, could be seen for sure as a personal situation that you could feel a little defensive about. So something like maternal gatekeeping. So if people who are listening don't know what that is, that's essentially when mothers control the household responsibilities, especially the interactions and responsibilities with children. So oftentimes, I think it could lead to the partner, not the birthing partner, feeling a little bit like the third wheel, because the the maternal or birthing person side is feeling like they're the one who birthed this child. They're the one, maybe if they're breastfeeding, who is breastfeeding. They're the one who has the natural instincts. Therefore, all of the responsibility falls on their shoulders. So what can we do to include our partners and not have them feel like this third wheel? You are hitting home on so many, such great questions. I love it. <laughs> I love it. Um, one of the things I struggled with was watching my wife breastfeed our daughter. I felt so out of this beautiful, magical experience. And I was so happy. I was like dealing with these two um, dynamics or didactics, we'll call them, two different feelings. I was so proud of my wife being an awesome mom. I was so happy for her that she had this experience of bonding with her child. And at the same time, I'm like, well, where do I fit? At the same moment, in one fell swoop. And I will say this. It is very natural on research studies. There's a great therapist. Her name is Dr. Cassidy Friedis, who specializes in postpartum in men. She's so cool. Her research paper is on that. She's a really awesome human being. And uh, we, we talked once. And one of the things that happens is that naturally, the mom who has maternity leave, men usually don't have paternity leave as part right. of their jobs. So you get a built-in time to connect with your child and truly find a rhythm with this new being, new mm -hmm. human. You get how they sleep, how they cry, how to change their diaper, how to put them to bed, all the back and forth. And this other person who hasn't had the same amount of time comes in, you're like, oh wait, we don't do it like that. Right. It naturally creates a space, naturally without someone doing it on purpose. So for moms out there, if that's what's happening, you're not even doing it on purpose. It's a natural response because you've just had more time. You've put yeah. more hours in, yeah. you get it. The other person might not. And that's okay. So here's the tip. Find something that is theirs. So like I said to you before, napping. My wife was not good at falling asleep while holding our child. So me and the Rickster, her name is Ricky, <laughs> me and the Rickster would take naps. So every opportunity I had, I did that. Maybe it meant that I did the silly stuff, like danced around with her and played around. My wife couldn't. But there were moments that was mine. Mm. It used to be that I was bedtime, always bedtime. Recently, my daughter has picked my wife for more bedtime. <laughs> so I have to readjust and find my time, my special moment that I feel is my connection with my child. I cannot replace my wife's ability to connect with my daughter. It is a beautiful blessing. I should not take that away and I shouldn't be offended by it. That's their special bond. And there will be moments when my daughter and I will have a bigger bond or different bond than my wife and my daughter will have. Mm -hmm. And I'm waiting for that moment to like shove it at my wife's face. Be like, ha ha, it's my time. <laughs> I'm kidding. I will not do that. But really, I'm really kidding. But in, in, in all honesty, you as the birthing parent need to learn to give up some control of every opportunity and let the other partner in to find their space. And once that happens, I will say... If any father can take paternity leave, I think it's the best thing you can do for your relationship with your child. It changed my confidence. It changed my relationship with my daughter. I stopped having panic attacks because I fully connected with my daughter because my wife went to work. It was just me and her. There was yeah. no other option. I had to learn. I had to push myself. And I wanted to. It wasn't that I didn't want to be a parent. I just didn't know what it was to be a parent. And so that experience of finding your little niche or niche, however you want to pronounce it, <laughs> um, and that moment that's just you and them is so powerful. And it could be as small as reading to them. It could be as small as napping. It could be as small as feeding. It could be that one feeding that you do a day. Or it could be in the middle of the night that, mm -hmm. you're, that your wife doesn't go in and you go in to calm and soothe your child. 
those moments are precious and that's what builds that relationship and helps you feel a part of the team and once that starts happening more and more it's a great it's a great thing and i think what kind of partners up with that is the fact that we need to also as the birthing person allow that to happen and so you know if we say okay Maybe it's say it's a day. Maybe fathers don't get paternity leave, but maybe it's like, okay, every Sunday is your day. Mm -hmm. So then as the birthing person, we need to say, okay, we are leaving the house or we're going into the bedroom and we are sleeping or working or reading or doing, and we're totally separating ourselves and giving the opportunity for our partner to fail if it's fail or to figure it out or to, you know, I think and there's only one of... failure, by the way, there's only one failure as a parent. You need to keep the baby alive. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Who cares if the socks aren't matching? I don't know. My <laughs> wife can tell. It's just funny that people tell, can tell when I get my daughter dressed and pick out her clothes, then when my <laughs> wife does it before she leaves for work. Yeah. Um, in the end, does it matter? No. No. My daughter's dressed. She's warm. She's wearing clothes. Mm -hmm. That's success. So as the birthing parent or the one who has maternity, the one who has been more in control and more on top Mm -hmm. of those things, letting go of some control and not just letting your partner fail, but learn. Learn how to change diapers. Okay, so it might not be perfect. And there might be a poop explosion that teaches them a lesson on how Mm -hmm. to tighten that diaper. (laughs) We've all had those. It is scary. Um, It might be you know, burping or um, playtime or Mm. dressing or feeding, these experiences, there's no failure. It's not a failure. That word failure needs to be taken out of of your vocabulary when it Mm. comes to parenting. There's only one failure, which is the baby not being healthy and well. Mm -hmm. And even that might not even be the the parent's fault. Things happen. And we don't wish that upon anyone. But as long as baby's healthy and well, fed and warm, you're good. Your partner's yeah. doing a great job and to be okay with that. And if you have real specific issues, bring it up in a calm, collected way, not in attacking, not in a divisive, intense way of like, you suck, you're a terrible parent. I'm not letting you do anything ever again. Calm, collected, compassion. They're learning just like you are. Hmm. And even going back to when you mentioned, you know, figuring out whatever your thing is, I think that's a perfect opportunity to have a conversation about that too. Like, we don't have to let our partner figure out what it is on their own. We can just say like, hey, what do you like? Is there anything you really love to do? Or what it kind of is your thing that you would like to just take over and have those moments or or like with you I see that you really are so good at napping and I just can't relax in that way like is that your thing you want that to be your thing because then at least there's the open communication like you feel like you're passing the torch I didn't know I was really good at napping with someone else on my body like I didn't know that was (laughs) I didn't know that was a a skill of mine (laughs) and I am so happy that I spoke up because it was bonding and comfort and I got to hold my child and smell my child and be with my child that I might not have ever had if I didn't speak up. What are some other things that maybe we as the birthing person might not know about what our partners are going through? So the interesting thing is that any mental health issue can show up differently per person. So I don't want to make like a blanket statement like anxiety and depression. Here's what it looks like in everyone. What I would say is the blanket statement I will say is that if your partner is different than they were before, You know their baseline. You know what their norm is. You know what their way that they function, talk, speak, sleep, eat, behave. You know that. You've been with them. You watch them. If something's off, we're not going to put a name of depression or anxiety, but if something's different or not what they normally behave, point it out. Become aware. Speak up notice, pay attention. Mm -hmm. If it keeps happening for a week or two, if they're not, if your partner's not eating for two weeks, the way that they normally eat, it's not because they're on a diet. (laughs) They could be not really doing well. If they don't want to get out of bed or they don't want to act a certain way, or they're lethargic or all these things that normally they have a lot of energy and they jump out of bed right away. It could be they're tired, but it could be that they're depressed, Mm -hmm. right? I'm making really big sweeps with this explanation. 
But the biggest thing is that if they're not behaving and acting the way they should be or normally would be, that's when you step in and that's when you point something out. Also, if you're concerned, speak to someone. Mm -hmm. Reach out to a therapist. Reach out to a professional. I have to say, actually, just a shout out to my daughter's PCP. When we went to our primary care doctor, all parents have to fill out a PHQ-9, which is a depression scale assessment. Normally, who goes to the appointments? The moms. I happened to go with my wife and myself and my mother-in-law. We went for the first one. And after that, I filled it out the second time. My wife did the first one. I happened to be holding the paper. I filled it out. My wife was watching our daughter. And the doctor came in and said, oh, mom, are you doing okay? My wife's like, yeah, I'm fine. She's like, but you filled out this paper. She goes, oh, he did. And the doctor then said, hey, dude, are you okay? Hmm. And I said, no, I'm not. And he then paid attention and said, okay, what can I do? What can I help? It was another person watching out. And it could have been that my wife noticed and she would have asked the doctor, don't be afraid to ask your your child's medical professional. Don't be afraid to ask a friend who might be a medical, a mental health professional, someone who can be objective if you're not sure, because your radar might be off. Just don't be afraid to ask because you'd rather ask and find out you're wrong than never ask and be wrong. And that's not a good place to be. Oh, that's such good advice and, and really a cool tool where maybe we're not quite comfortable to have these conversations with our partner, but maybe it's a matter of doing it that way, like speaking to our child's primary care and then having our partner take our child to an appointment because then there's an awesome opportunity for them to just have I had that no idea they did that, by the way. So I had no idea neat. that you had to fill it out because they're worried about postpartum depression yeah. in moms. Mm-hmm. So usually the person who brings the appointment is the mom. So but what about the dads? Yeah. Nah, no one cares about us, unfortunately, sometimes. Well, but that's why I'm doing what I'm doing, yeah. right? Because a lot of all parents matter. Yeah. Every parent matters. doesn't matter your gender, your role in the parenting. Yeah. It's hard. It's a rough road, but it doesn't mean that it's not worth it. Yeah. And, and we're having this conversation today to change the conversation. So I'm so happy that we were able to talk about this. And, you know, a nice tool, too, is now that we have this conversation with someone who's been through it, someone who has, you know, firsthand experienced the anxiety of it and who's bounced back, you know, play this episode for your partner if if it could be something even if you have the opportunity to play it for them and listen to it together before yet that baby comes earth side so that you can really have these conversations is there anything ellie that you would say to the partner if maybe the partner is listening right now something that you would say to them to help encourage them or support them one of the things that i wasn't aware of is that there are so many men and people who struggle with fatherhood and parenting, finding their role, finding their place, understanding who they are in the new world of parenting. There are so many people on social media, on Facebook, online, who are supportive and loving, myself included. If you want to reach out and say, hey, dude, I'm struggling, I will talk to you. I will, I, you don't have to be my client for me to help. <laughs> I mean that with all my heart. And there are plenty of other men that I can connect you with, who I have connected over the years, who are fathers, who are struggling. When I was really going through a struggle, I saw an amazing page, Chronicles of a Daddy, his name is. Um, and his name is Muhammad. He's an awesome man. He has like six kids. Mm. Um, and he posted something about his role during breastfeeding. And it really spoke to me. And I reached out to him. We're buddies. We talk. And because of him and my reaching out to him and talking to him and commenting on his post, I ended up on the Kelly Clarkson show to talk about <laughs> fatherhood and, and mental health. You just don't know who you're going to connect with. And you don't know just by asking what answer you're going to get. If you're afraid to do it in person, do it with the anonymous social media. Mm -hmm. you know. And if you really are struggling you need to realize you're not alone and you should not have to go it alone. So ask for help. How can people connect more with you? Yeah, so I have a website, www, by the way, that just showed you I grew up in the 90s. <laughs> exactly. um, I just said that. <laughs> wow. 
Um, you can go to <laughs> Ellie Weinstein, thing. right? <laughs> I don't know why I just did that. www.youtube.com. Yeah. <laughs> um, you can go to Ellie Weinstein, LCSW.com was my website. You can go to my social media, which is Ellie Weinstein underscore LCSW. Or you can tune into my podcast, The Dude Therapist, where I had Jessica on, wrapping mm-hmm. up awesome season two. Um, and really, anyway, reach out and I'll see if I can help. Amazing. And if I can't, I'll try to find someone who can. You're the best. All the links to you will be in the show notes so people can have easy access. Just click on over there and check out Ellie and all the work that he's doing. Thanks for having this conversation today. I think it's really important for for everyone included in the parenthood process. So I appreciate you. Thank you so much, Jessica. You're the best. Of course. I know it can feel like we have way too much to worry about during this time. And aren't we dealing with enough to worry about somebody else? But opening up these conversations with your partner could be a matter of saving your relationship, truly. And if starting to have these conversations brings out some of the fears that you both work through, then what a blessing to address those fears before they become more intense. I loved Ellie's recommendation to figuring out what our partner's thing is going to be. Like, what can they always do that will be their moment to help them bond with baby? To hear how others have navigated the emotions of their partner, join us in the free Facebook community, Mamas in Training. Sign up is super easy. All you have to do is click on the link in the show notes that says Facebook community, and you'll be able to post up your question today and hear back from others how they did it. Sometimes it's easier to get recommendations from others who've been there. I can't wait to see you there. If you enjoyed the show today, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss an episode and leave a review on Apple Podcasts so I know how to better serve you. I'd also love for you to join our community of Mamas in Training on Facebook. You can find me at Mamas in Training on Instagram and at mamasintraining.com. For Mamas in Training, I'm Jessica Lorian. We're in this together.